Now, a lot of the work that's done on the uh, International Space Station was really uh, the way it was really paved by a series of missions flown on the shuttle carrying a laboratory module in the payload bay. That was called Space Lab. And today we have a veteran of two of those Space Lab missions. He's from Jamestown, Tennessee. He holds three advanced degrees in physics. He was a senior scientist for the International Space Station program from 2000 to 2004. He's done a great deal of research in the area of uh, uh, crystal growth uh, for semiconductors. And uh, he was a payload specialist for STS-83 and STS-94. Very unique circumstance he's going to tell you about surrounding those two missions. Uh, he is with us today to share his remarkable perspective on all this history. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome astronaut Roger Crouch. Before you take off those three engines on the back of the shuttle at night, when they ignite, it sort of shakes you around like you're riding a bicycle down a dirt road or something like that. And then when the solid rocket motors, those big white things on the side ignite, it shakes you like you're riding a bicycle down a railroad track. It just shakes the far out of you, and you can't even focus enough to read the dials and things in front of you that the pilot and the commander have in front of them. So the computer's doing all the work at that time. Takes you about 10 seconds to get through the, uh, the the sound barrier. Once you get through the sound barrier, that real low frequency hard shaking goes away, and there's a lot of high frequency stuff that's sort of like being in a car or a, a trailer or something with a metal roof on it during a fairly severe hailstorm. So if you know what those noises are like, that's kind of what the ride is like when the solids are burned. After two minutes, they run out of fuel. Once they run out of fuel. Uh, you go from that to one time the force of gravity, so you're just laying there on your back like you're laying here on the ground. Really comfortable, feels really good. And then the thing, and it gets really quiet. Those engines, the solid rocket engine, I mean the main engines that are on the shuttle are so efficient that there's almost no extra noise at all. Just a very quiet acceleration back up to three times the force of gravity, and then you're in orbit. And then they throttle down so that you don't get above three times the force of gravity because that's a structural limit on the shuttle, uh, the, the orbiter. The uh, feeling that you have when you're doing through all of that is sort of like uh, you're, you're laying there on your back because if you were sitting up, having that kind of a g-force on you or that kind of acceleration would drain the blood down out of your brain uh, once it did that you'd probably start to talk with a Tennessee accent like mine, and then a few minutes later you'd pass out. So <clears throat> it would uh, not be a real good thing to do, but lying on your back like that, it pushes your rib back against your, I mean your lungs back against your rib cage, and trying to breathe in, it flattens them out. And so trying to breathe in is sort of like trying to blow up a balloon if somebody got their foot resting on it or something like that. So it's not a real easy thing to do. We do a training profile in a centrifuge where they spin you around, so we sort of know what that's going to feel like, and we're, we're sort of uh, know how you breathe. You sort of go, because <sighs> <sighs> breathing out's real easy. You just let go and it pushes you right out of there for you. But breathing in, you sort of have to suck it in and, and uh, do a little bit of work to do that. After eight, a little over eight minutes, maybe eight minutes and 20 seconds or so, you're in orbit. You're going 17,500 miles an hour. First time we flew, uh, it's Easter weekend, first of April, um, spring break, all kinds of crowds here in the Florida area. Of course, back then, anybody that wanted to could go out on the causeway and see the launch, so they had a huge crowd. Heard a horrible traffic jam after the thing was over. Took my family three hours to go eight miles back to the motel that they were staying in. By that time, we'd gone around the world twice, so I got to give them a pretty good time about that. Yeah. Um, the, um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Let me talk a little, Nick mentioned that I got two flights, and uh, let me tell you, 
there's three kinds of astronauts. There are commanders and pilots, and those are the people that come out of the military. They've got maybe a thousand hours or more of high performance aircraft, flying jets and big airplanes like that, uh, <clears throat> supersonic kinds of aircraft. And then there are mission specialists who are career astronauts that work for NASA full time and they live down at the Johnson Space Center or work down at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And their job is to maintain the shuttle while it's in orbit. They're the ones that do the EVAs or the spacewalks. They're the ones that fix malfunctions on the hardware that's on the shuttle or something like that. They're the ones that also do most of the science experiments on board. Occasionally there will be a special set of scientific experiments that are, that are scheduled to all go on one flight. We used to have this thing about the size of a school bus that laid in the cargo bay of the shuttle and along where the seats would be in the school bus we had uh, racks of scientific experiments and sometimes when we were flying the space lab the experiments that were on board were too sophisticated or too complicated for the astronauts to learn how to, how to uh, carry them out or what kinds of scientific phenomena to look for and they just didn't have time to train them well enough for them to do that and so the scientific community would recommend that a civilian be allowed to fly with that set of experiments and he would be selected by the science community and, and recommended to the astronaut office and then they would let him go or her go and that was uh, what was called a payload specialist because they were specialists just in that one flight. So I started wanting to be an astronaut when I was about 10 years old. But we didn't have space programs anywhere. It was all science fiction. But I saw a movie called Destination Moon. And I loved that movie. And it was just so cool. And being, going to the moon just seemed like the thing that a person needed to do. So I put it in the back of my mind. And then when I was a junior in high school, I decided I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So I was a sort of uh, Chuck Yeager was sort of my hero. Chuck sort of... West Virginia boy doing real well. He's the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound. And I think he's sort of like what I wanted to be. And I applied for the Navy and I went down and, and uh, it got, went through the physical and I said, sorry, you're colorblind. We don't want you. You're out. Well, that's kind of disappointing. But when I was a sophomore in college, I tried the Marines. But they had a program. They said, nope, colorblind, you're out. Next year, I tried the Air Force, and they said, <laughs> you're colorblind, now. you'll never get in the Air Force. So I gave up on that, and by now, we'd started the space program. So I said, well, forget that fighter pilot stuff. I'll just go straight to the moon. So I started sending in applications to NASA, and I sent them in for about 17 years or so. Every time they'd open up, I'd send in one, you know, and uh, for some reason, my mom called me stubborn, but I don't know why she would do that. But after all this time, I finally called her, and I said, hey, why do I never hear from you guys when I send in an application? They said, <laughs> you're colorblind. We just throw that thing in the drain, man. So, well, that's kind of frustrating. So now I'm, run I'm running out of options on how to get to the moon. Well, when I'm 40 years old, I found, about this, found out about this payload specialist program, and guess what? I started applying for that. And guess what's even better is that you can be a payload specialist and be colorblind. So now I'm all set to go, you know. Well, it takes me 16 more years before I finally get picked, but I'm almost 56 by the time I get picked to fly. And so for the young people in the audience, uh, just never give up on something you want. I may not get to go to the moon, but if there's anybody here that gets a vote on that, I want to start a 100-year-old man on the moon program. Guess who I'm nominated to be that man? So keep that in mind if you've got a lot of influence with whoever the next two or three presidents are going to be. I, that's, I'm the guy that wants to do that for you. But, but being an astronaut compared to not getting to go to the moon is still pretty good, so that's not so bad. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Launch morning, we get up. Uh, they come in the night before and they come over and they say, now, honey, you can have anything you want to eat for breakfast in the morning. Well, this sounds to me like those gangster movies where they come in the night before you go into the electric chair and they say, you know, you can have whatever you want for breakfast. So that sounds, that doesn't settle my nerves any. Next morning we get up and we go in and we have that breakfast and we go in and we get dressed in the lunch and entry suit, that orange suit that, that uh, Mark talked about. And the purpose for that is that if the shuttle blows up while you're taking off, there's a chance you might be able to bail out and so that doesn't calm your nerves. And when you go down and you get in the, 
Astro Van, which is this uh, Airstream looking camper thing. And you ride out towards the launch pad, they got cop cars in front of you, you know, and sirens going off, and lights flashing, and cop car behind you, and all those lights flashing, and sirens going off, and the helicopter flying up over you, and a guy sitting in the bay of the car, of the helicopter with a big long rifle, you know, and you think, oh man, they really treat you like a big shot on launch day. This is really cool. Well, I moved into Washington, D.C. about four or five years ago. And they do almost that same thing every morning when they bring the prisoners in for the federal court. I don't know if you're one of the that guy was except to just wing us as we tried to run away until they pushed back down because they didn't want to waste all that money on training they got. And then you get out to the lawn pad and you look up, and as you'll notice if you drive around on the, on the center today or if you're riding around in the bus, this is a game preserve and a bird preserve and all that stuff. And you guess which bird is the most popular? Buzzards. So you get out the lunch pad and you look up and there's all these buzzards circling around. <laughs> so once again, I'm thinking this is going to be really scary. And I talked to some of the guys that had flown before and they said, yeah, Roger, you're going to be terrified when you go out there on lunch morning. It's going to be so scary that you're going to want to run away. But it's more embarrassing to run away than it is to die, so don't worry about you. <laughs> So I got on, you know, and I felt so lucky to be there. I felt so, so many things that were out of my control that had happened in my life that allowed me to finally be there. That if it was my day, I'd rather get it here than to get it on the Beltway in Washington or something like that. So I felt really good about being there and was actually able to take a nap while we were laying there for a couple of hours getting ready to launch. And so I felt real lucky about that. The uh, Living up there is just the, the best feeling that, that you can imagine. Sleeping, that we were working two shifts, so we had a, a a sleep station that's about the size of a, well, again, I'm talking too much about the macabre here, but it's about the size of a, of a coffin, and doesn't have any pillows in it or anything. It just sort of has a pad on the wall so you won't make a lot of noise. And when you go into that thing, you just float in there, and what I would do is just close the door and go to sleep. So I'm on this ultimate air mattress all night long. It's just absolutely wonderful. Now, a lot of people can't sleep very good up there, and they like to feel like they're laying down in bed, so we put them on their bed, and we've got a big Velcro strap they can put across their body to Velcro them to the bed so they feel like they're laying down. And some of them like to have a pillow. Well, of course, the pillow would just float away if you were just to give them a regular pillow. So when they strap themselves down like this, we also give them a big pillow and a big piece of Velcro and strap that to their head. So they're walking around with a big pillow strapped to their head. But it works. They sleep better by doing it. So uh, I guess different strokes for different folks as that goes on. The uh, adaptation up there for me the first time, when you unbuck your seatbelt and you just float up out of your seat, it's just a wonderful feeling except I shook my head like that and I said, whoa. I won't be doing that anymore. Now, have you ever been on a merry-go-round that goes around and around and around like that, and then when you get off, you're sort of dizzy or sort of sick at your stomach? Have you ever done that? Well, I did that when I was a little kid. And when I got in space, I felt that same feeling. I felt like, whoa, I am going to throw up if I'm not really careful. And so, sorry about your lunch. <laughs> and uh, so the first day and a half, I had to be real careful not to move my head very fast and to keep it pretty much stationary with the rest of my body. And by doing that, uh, I made it okay. About mid midway through the second day, I just did a, some sort of a shift in my brain and I felt great. Absolutely no problem at all. I can shake my head, I can turn somersaults, I can rotate and flip, and just felt great. <coughs> Excuse me, the second time we flew, which was three months later, um, we also, uh, as soon as we unbuck as I unbuckled, I shook my head and I just felt great. I had no symptoms at all of space adaptation. So I can turn somersaults, flips, or whatever, and had no problem. Now, let me explain why I was lucky enough to get two flights in three months. We uh, went up in April, and as soon as we took off, actually while we were still on the ground, there's three things on board called fuel cells. And these fuel cells are like the batteries that provide all the energy or power you need while you're on orbit. And one of them, they run off of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which is the same thing that we use for fuel in the three rocket engines that are on the back of the orbiter. And so we know what happens when these things go into an uncontrolled mixture, and when they get a spark, it causes them to ignite. 
they'll burn and they'll burn really fast. And down here we would call that a uh, an explosion, but of course NASA doesn't want to call it that, so we call it the potential for an uncontrolled burn. And, and so what they wanted to do was make sure that that didn't happen, so as soon as we got on orbit and they started getting these readings indicating that we were going to have an uncontrolled burn if we weren't careful, they shut that uh, fuel cell down. Well, that's, just like if you were here and you were getting ready to go back to the airport, well, no, let's say you were here and you are getting ready to go home, and you get in your car and a third of your battery dies, you're going to want to go back and get another car. You're not going to want to try to make a long trip with just two-thirds of the power you need. And with a car, what would happen if you lost another third was that you'd just be stranded somewhere and somebody'd have to come and get you. But with a space shuttle, if you lose another one of the fuel cells, then they make a movie of your life. And so we didn't want that to happen. <laughs> and so, um, they decided, well, we'll bring them back home as soon as they're back over Florida. But when you go into orbit, you're just going around in a circle like this, but the Earth's rotating under you. So the first time you come up over Mississippi, say, and then Texas, and then New Mexico, and then California, and, and so forth, and it's four days before you're back over Florida. So on the fourth day, we landed of what was supposed to be a 16-day mission. And they come out and they say, well, we're getting ready to build the International Space Station. And we're real concerned that we're going to have to be flying the shuttle a lot more often than we have in the past. And we're concerned that crews cannot stand the physical and mental stress of flying two missions fairly close together. Duh, give me a break. It's the most fun I've ever had in my life. I've been almost 60 years to do it. And they say, would you be willing to go again? <laughs> so uh, here I am, you know, and I don't believe it. I'm I mean, I thought I was lucky to get to fly the first time. And I was aggravated as only four days. But still, for them to come out and say, would you fly again, which nobody had ever done, and nobody still has ever done, I didn't believe them for anything, you know. So we go back down to Johnson, and we're all just sitting around training, continuing to train, continuing to train. I said, well, we're wasting a lot of money having all this training if we're not going to fly again. So finally about a month later, I began to believe, yeah, maybe we really are going again, you know. And so sure enough, in July, three months later, we got to go back up and do the full 16-day mission. First time we flew, we had more problems than anybody that, uh, has ever had that made it back. And second time, we had fewer problems than anybody's ever had that made it back. So we're sort of both into the statistics there on how to, how to fly a mission. Uh, let's see. How much more time we got? Can I go to questions now? Or is it? I don't know what else to talk about. You saw the food, you saw the toilet, you saw... Let me tell you about readapting once you come back down. When you're down here on the ground, and you sort of bend over like this, your brain has learned that what I need to do is sort of move this thing to balance this thing so that everything's over this thing. So you want to keep your point of contact with the ground sort of below your center of gravity. And so it learns how to do that. Well, you go into space, and your brain's a real efficient computer, and it doesn't want you to work any harder than you want to prove it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you're in space and you bend over, there's no point of contact. So it's hard to shift anything, so it really can't do anything. And, and it doesn't need to anyway, because the worst you're going to do is just sort of do a little tumble or somersault or roll. And so it just quits working that way. But when we got back down after the first flight, we get down and we're landing, and uh, our seats are about like this in front of the lockers in front of us, you know. I stand up like this, and I bend over because I've got the yellow suit on, these pockets are real full, and I pull my parachute straps out to go over that. And when I do, boom, my brain doesn't do any of the shift and stuff, and I just fall straight into the wall. So I sit back down, okay, brain, get me straight here, let me do this thing right. And it readapted pretty quickly, and there wasn't any problem with that. Second time we come back, um, we were working two shifts, like I said, and we go back to the motel, and I've been up about 26 hours, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm ready to take a nap before we go out to dinner. And so I go to sleep, and I'm really, really tired, you know. I've been asleep about an hour, and I wake up, sort of wake up, about half asleep, half awake, and I really need to go to the bathroom. So I looked around the motel room, and said, yeah, there's a bathroom over there. 
I'll just float over there and go to bed. <laughs> so I push out the bed like that. Sure enough, I push hard enough to clear the bed. But not hard enough to clear gravity, of course. I'm too sleepy to know what I'm doing, so I don't catch myself. Go face first in the floor, bloody nose, fat lip. Say a few things my wife had not heard in a couple of weeks. And then I say, okay, Brain, help me out here. You know, you got to be better than this. So you get over that kind of stuff fairly quickly. But uh, I think it takes me longer than it takes most people to get over that. But anyway. We'll open it up for questions now. Yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and come up from the microphone. How about the noise level when you're in the, at the front of the rock and the engines are behind you? How noisy is it? Can everybody hear that? I need to repeat. The question was, what's the, what's the noise level inside the spaceship? And because there's the show, because the, the rockets are behind you, with a lot of the noise it's really a reflection off of the concrete and stuff like that. And so, but you've got the launch and entry suit on, you've got your visor down, you're inside your own little spaceship there in case you have to bail out or anything like that. And so that suppresses most of the noise. It, you hear that popping and cracking and stuff like that, you hear a rumbling, you hear, and, and sometimes it's possible that you might accidentally not get your face mask clipped all the way down so that you can hear what the environment really is. It's pretty noisy in there, but it's, uh, and, and like I say, it's like a really bad hailstorm in a, in a metal roof building or something like that. The, just the machines that are in there, once you get on orbit, there's a lot of fans, a lot of hardware running and stuff like that. It's about 60, 65 dB, which is uh, it's a fairly noisy environment. It, it's uh, not real quiet. And a question right here. I read recently where there's some concern about accumulating space debris out in space, and what are they going to do with that uh, situation? Okay, space debris comes from two or three different sources. One is satellites that are up there. Another one is where or things that are jettisoned off of satellites that are up there, or satellites that come apart for one reason or another. Uh, and then just natural phenomena like meteorites and, and little, little asteroids and things like that. The, uh, mostly micrometeorites is the problem. The Air Force can track things that are down to 10 centimeters, which is about five inches very well. And then from there on down, the probability that they'll see it before it does any damage goes down fairly quickly. So that things below one centimeter, which is half an inch or so, uh, they wouldn't see it all. The, the 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 hope right now is just to stay out of the way. I mean, they're, they're really, if you were to run into some big something like that, it would be a problem. The thing that we try to do is to make sure that in all the countries in the world now, including China, after they blew one up, they blew one up, which created several thousand pieces in that orbit. Uh, the, the main thing we try to do right now is to uh, just make everything clean so that there's no debris left from that. These little things can really do damage. We got hit by about five or six different little micrometeorites when we were up there. One of them hit the top window in the shuttle and it made a, the windows are of course an inch thick so it wasn't really any damage. I mean, it wasn't any fear that it would shatter the window but if it had been big enough it might have. But it hit the window and it made a little ding in it, sort of like a, if you've ever seen where a BB shot into a, a piece of glass or something and, and took a little ding at it, or gravel hits the windshield and doesn't make a star pattern, but just makes a little gouge in it. Uh, four or five of them hit the, the heat shields, where it hit the heat shield. Um, it basically went all the way through those things because they're fairly low density, fairly soft. It didn't penetrate the, the thermal blanket that's down under there. The hole that it made was a conical shape that was at the top about the size of your little finger and then went down in a cone uh, down inside of that. Uh, again, no problem from that, the, the, even though it, it exposed a very small area of the, heat, of the inside of the, or beneath the heat shield, there wasn't a, the, the heating over that area was small enough that it didn't really create any problems or something. The main concern would be that if you're out there doing an EVA and you got hit by something like that, it might penetrate your, your space suit. Uh, it would be sort of like getting shot and you wouldn't, you, 
try to get back inside as soon as you could, and then once you got back inside, you'd have to do first aid on the wound for the person or something like that. Right now, even though there's a lot of them up there, the other thing that is there's an awful lot of space. So mm -hmm. the density per square foot is, is, is real low. So the probability of getting hit is not, not real high. When, when something happens like that, uh, DOD satellite that's going to auger back in uh, next week. Next week? Yeah. Or, or sometime this month or, or in March. Whenever it comes back in, uh, something like that's out of control. That, that was big enough you can track. But some of the out of control satellites that are up there, we, unless they're big enough for the uh, DOD to pick up, we really don't know where they are. So we just look out for them. Okay. Got a question right here. When you uh, walk through the rock garden and you see the Mercury, Mercury capsule with the Gemini, uh, a vehicle barely large enough for two small men, and then you continue to walk around and they get larger and more complicated, more sophisticated, more powerful. What has happened in the requirements or the uh, profile for the astronauts? How has it changed? What has it changed? The, uh, the original seven, they didn't know what was going to happen to humans when they went into space. I talked to John Glenn about, about that and he said, that before his first flight, they told him that his eyeballs, I mean, they don't do anything to make it easier for you, you know, they try to scare the far out of you, I think. But he told me that they told him that his eyeballs might pop out of his head or they might just explode. They didn't know which. And uh, they didn't know what effect being in space would have on you. So what they tried to do there was pick guys that are, you know, like 99 percentile physical shape. So, that are in the very best possible physical shape. And then before they sent them into space, they wanted to test everything about them so that when they brought them back, they'd be able to, to, to document any changes. They did that sort of on the first three classes that they picked, the first three groups that they picked. And what they found out was that humans are amazingly adaptable, that we don't really function much differently in space than monkeys or dogs do, which had flown before us, and that, uh, you really didn't have to be in that good of shape. So the second time John Glenn flew, he was 77 years old, had a lot of the same ailments that most 77 year old guys do, although he was still, in for, he was very fit for a 77 year old, but just the fact that he was 77 when he flew, more or less documents that, that they relaxed the changes a whole lot. If you didn't, couldn't tell by just looking at me, then you'd certainly tell by it, knowing John was 77 when he flew the second time. So they relax them a lot. The, the main thing they sort of need to be in good enough physical shape. You can run away from land and uh, have an emergency landing, and it's going to blow up. You need to get away and uh, wait on somebody to come and get you or something like that. So it doesn't take a whole lot. And the question right here: As you look back at the Earth and see the land forms, are there any that are very distinguishable? And what about that Great Wall of China? Do you see it or not? Uh, the easy question is no, you don't. Uh, I've got a picture that Leroy Chow took when he was up there, and I defy anybody to pick out the Great Wall of China on that. And it's just, it, you just can't see it. Things you see from up there, you're only 220 or 280 miles, maybe 300 miles altitude, depending on which mission you're on. Uh, the kinds of things you see are things that are, where there's a lot of contrast, or things that are in unnatural shape. So straight lines are easy to see, like airports. Uh, cities are real easy to see. Uh, the weight behind a ship on the ocean, if you're looking at it in the glint, you can see those real well. The, uh, there's a big pipeline that goes across the Sahara Desert, and in the afternoon when the sun gets, leaves a real dark shadow on one side of that, it's easy to see. Uh, the dimensions of things you can see without binoculars and so forth, is uh, something that's probably a quarter of a mile in diameter or, or something about that size. Uh, you, you only see about a third of the Earth when you're in the shuttle. You don't, it's not the blue dot that the Apollo guys got to see. And uh, probably the most remarkable things to see are lakes and mountains and things like that. You can see, we were over Baja, California, and I can see the Grand Tetons. 
But more than a thousand miles or so, you have to have a distinct feature. One day we were coming up and it was just daylight coming over the northern tip of South America. We were oriented looking down the Andes and I could see the entire chain of the Andes, which was just awesome. I still get cold chills just thinking about that. It's just spectacular. I would be one.